Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all had good lunch and good rest. So, yes, there is an announcement here. You need to switch it on, I guess. So, tonight there will be a reception at uh, uh, Adriatico at 7 uh, p.m. So, uh, everyone is welcome. And uh, I also rem remind that uh, after this lecture, there will be, uh, after the coffee break, there will be a discussion session. So yeah. everyone is welcome for that too. Okay, great. So we're all looking forward to dinner. Right. Um, uh, let's recall a little bit what we've done uh, on the last lecture. So I want to bring up only a few key points which, will be, which we will need to, today. One thing is uh, we looked at the geodesic deviation equation in the case of the gravitational wave. So the deviation of geodesic caused by passing gravitational wave. And we have uh, derived the equations uh, of motion. Uh, assuming that gravitational wave is weak, which is always true. And the uh, other important aspect for us, we have uh, derived a formula for generation of gravitational waves in the leading order, so-called quadruple formula, which is uh, shown here. And I want to, again, emphasize assumptions which went into deriving this. So this is valid for any source which is isolated. Isolated, it means it's confined within some volume, all the matter confined within some certain volume. Uh, we look at the observer which is far, far away from the, so from the source, so it's uh, in a far zone, so distance between observer and the system, many, many gravitational wavelengths. We assume that uh, so the source is, has a weak internal gravity and uh, slow velocities. What else? Well, that's basically it. And it turned out that this formula also valid if you drop assumption of uh, weak internal gravity. The calculations to show that are much more lengthy, uh, but it turned out that uh, this formula is still valid. And I want to write one more thing. We introduce here uh, what is called quadruple mass quadruple moment, and I want to write uh, close relative to the mass quadruple moment, uh, i, j, k, it's integral t, zero, zero, x, j is called hat, x, j, k, and integral over three volume over x. This is second uh, order of mass distribution, which you all know from uh, probably even school. And uh, basically, if you compare this i, j, k with m, i, j, k, uh, if you take, remove trace from this, you will get the, the this is basically trace. The traceless part of this equation. We will need it when we will look at the binary system coming now. Um, and otherwise, I didn't say anything about the source. I didn't say it's binary or something else. In principle, it's any system. And if you have a non-zero quadruple moment, and if it's time dependent, and if it's not vanishing a second derivative, you have gravitational waves. And of course, if, you, if it's a vanishing, it doesn't mean that there are no gravitational waves. You might want to consider higher order multiples, and just gravitational wave will be significantly weaker. <clears throat> We've done this. And now I'm coming to a very important part, is the stress-energy tensor for gravitational waves. In principle, it's very hard to define. Uh, one reason is, let me jump a few slides back. Yeah, and look at this equation. So this uh, wave equation for the trace reverse part of the metric, and you might try to associate this with stress energy tensor of gravitational wave. However, this part is not gauge invariant. So it really depends on your coordinate frame, which is not acceptable for a properly defined uh, stress energy tensor. So it's not a tensor. It does not transform as a tensor because gauge depend this left-hand side is gauge dependent, as we know. So there is uh, this term over here. And that is uh, one of the reasons why Einstein actually, after uh, introducing gravitational waves, dropped this, because he thought that uh, there could be some 
transformation, Cordian transformation, which could eliminate them. Nevertheless, uh, they are not fictitious. They cannot be removed by Cordian transformation. And, uh, um, but however, they're not uh, really localizable. You can make tensor out of it, but you need to average over several wavelengths. So if you take this quantity and average over several wavelengths, this is what uh, uh, triangle brackets stand for, you will get a tensor and uh, actually which describes energy and the other component of stress energy tensor which uh, belong to gravitational wave. One way I like it very much, it's uh, there is exercise, there is or even section in a book by Bernard Schultz, the first core to general relativity. Uh, I like the approach how he derives this. He basically considers gravitational wave and he considers the spring, okay? There are two bodies in the spring and the gravitational wave passing by, spring starts to oscillate and therefore, you know, you have some force and energy pumping into the system which you can estimate and you can see that actually, yes, you can, this in accord to um, this formula which could be derived in a quite complex way and it was done first by Isaacson a uh, long time ago. I will not speak more about this formula, but I want to bring a consequence. It's uh, energy loss or energy flux and the same uh, flux for angular momentum. And they, again, you, the, the, the averaging comes here as well. And they depend on the quadrupole moment of the system and the second and third derivatives of it. Right, and of course, uh, higher multiples also add up to this. It's just leading order expressions. You, I hope you all know Levi-Civita indices, but anyway, I will not use these expressions. I will use mainly this one. Okay? Did I convince you that there are gravitational waves and there are energy which carry the wave? Probably not, but believe me. Um, so, let's now consider binary system. Very simple one, M1 and M2, on a circular orbit. I place coordinate frame X, Y, this is a plane in which uh, bodies rotate at the center of mass of this system. So M1, I just define M1 so that M1 is larger than M2. The total mass of the system is uh, M big, and also reduced mass ratio, what is called M1, M2, divided by total mass. Uh, excuse me, I forgot to each of this thing. Good. And uh, I will start uh, using Kepler's law. It's very simple uh, relationship between uh, orbital angular velocity, of, sorry, frequency, and uh, total mass and the separation between masses in a binary system. Uh, before I proceed, I want to give one remark about these quantities. So these quantities appear quite naturally when you're trying to solve the Kepler problem, when you have two bodies, uh, comparable masses, you can reduce this problem into the central uh, field problem where you place body with mass M big, and you're considering uh, other mass with um, uh, body with mass mu moving around it. And that's uh, the best way to solve uh, actually Kepler two body problem in Newtonian dynamics. Why I'm mentioning this? Because there is a relativistic extension of this problem, and I will mention very briefly a bit later, called effective one-body approach, uh, the way of solving two-body problem in general relativity. Not exactly, of course, you don't, we don't have exact solution, but approximately. Well, now, let's proceed. I placed uh, two bodies initially along x-axis, and the equation of motion for each body is very simple. There's nothing complicated. Uh, and then I want to compute why I have written this. This is second order of mass distribution. And here I'm making one more assumption. I'm assuming that uh, size of the body, basically it's a point masses. What does it mean, point masses? There are no point masses in the physics. It means that uh, size of each body much, much smaller than separation between them. And this approximation, I can treat them as a point masses. And by doing this, uh, the, this tensor 
um, second, mass, second order of mass distribution becomes very simple. M1 times X1, X1, M2 times X2, X2. And now what I'm doing, I substitute X1, X2, Y1, Y2 in these uh, expressions. JK basically stands for XY, okay? And index one and two labels bodies. If you do that, you will get these expressions. Now, uh, one way of proceeding is to taking TT part of this thing and uh, trying to derive what we have before this IJK. I want to actually jump a bit uh, and derive right away H plus H cross. And, uh, well, the, it doesn't matter which route you will take, but you will end up with the same answer. And to derive H plus H cross, I will introduce polarization basis. And I introduce quite simplified polarization basis. I assume that gravitational, well, the observer is lying in the ZX, ZY plane. It doesn't matter, um, well, it, it cannot, you will see it in the next plot, uh, that it, uh, how it looks like. And in this, using this assumption about the position of observer, I can introduce phi and uh, theta direct unit vectors along theta and phi directions. So let me actually draw it. It might be easier. This is vector of uh, gravitational wave propagation. So Earth and observer like a Virgo somewhere there. This is your source frame. And uh, theta is basically this angle and phi is this angle or depending, you can want to might define theta phi in that direction, but it doesn't really matter. It will just change slightly the sign. So theta and phi is the uh, unit coordinate uh, vector along uh, theta lines, theta coordinates, and along phi coordinates, okay? <clears throat> and uh, doing this, I can transform this tensor into this coordinate frame. It's very simple. There is no phi dependence because I have chosen um, k direction. I will comment on this a bit later. And h plus h cross, actually almost immediately in this frame is equal theta theta component and theta phi component. So I avoid doing tt part. It's this, uh, this smart choice of this coordinate frame, uh, this one, xy, which reflects symmetry of the, of the system and the uh, position of, of my, and uh, these two vectors allowed me actually to avoid some uh, mathematical operations. And I immediately got plus and cross polarization. So it's very simple, okay? Do you want me to wait so you finish writing? Or I can go ahead. In principle, all the slides from yesterday are already on, on the web. You can download and have a look at them. Let's move on. Uh, I'm too far away. This again, these expressions here, I want to discuss them a little bit more. So this is uh, what I have uh, plot you on a, on a board. Um, the fact that I put a k in some chosen direction, it's actually always allowed. Because for the system, I never specify I only, what I really specify is the direction of z. My z is orthogonal to the orbital plane. So since my bodies are not spinning, z is also pointing along orbital angular momentum, L. And uh, I still have a freedom to choose x, y. So I can rotate x, y the way I want. So I can, for instance, choose y or x so that k vector always lie in its plane. Here, for instance, in the ZY plane, or I can choose it to lie in XZ plane. But then I introduce the initial angle phi naught between uh, initial uh, line uh, separating two bodies and my choice of XY. And this angle actually appears there. So if you remember, in previous equations, there was no phi naught angle, but I can always rotate, and uh, there is a freedom of choosing XY. It translates in the choosing initial phase of my binary, basically. And this more general case. 
Then I want to discuss a little bit about this angle appearing here, here. And as I said, it's an angle between uh, z-axis, so orbital angular momentum, and direction to the observer, direction to where LIGO, Virgo, Earth in general is. We can call it uh, angle between direction of propagation of gravitational wave and uh, uh, orbital angular momentum. Sometimes, and it's uh, actually quite often used, other angle. It's convenient when we're looking at the sitting on the detector. So instead of taking direction of propagation of gravitational wave, we're taking different direction, minus k. It's direction to the source. So it's natural. You're sitting on the detector, you want to ask where the source is. It's there. So sometimes another angle, you use iota, which is pi minus theta d. I just want to warn you, in the literature, they're both appearing, and even in the lectures which I'm giving now, depending if I'm talking about sources or detector, I will use iota or theta d. But it's a very trivial thing. Another thing about uh, this angle, so you can see that the maximum of amplitude achieved where uh, cosine of theta d is plus or minus one, which means that we see orbit either face on or face off. So these two systems, this orientation of the binary system, give us the maximum amplitude of gravitational wave. And the minimum will be if you see it age on. And that's important part. And that's actually what we observe now with LIGO and Virgo. Majority of the system which we detected are either face on or off. Why is that? Because even uh, increase in factor two in amplitude increase, increases the volume which we can access with a given fixed sensitivity of the detector by a, a cube of the distance. So it gives event rate by factor eight larger for these systems. And it's more likely, this is what's called sometimes observational bias, it's more likely that we will see systems which are face on or off than H on. This distance which appears here is a luminosity distance because graviton is a massless particle. There are several distances used in cosmology and here the one which is uh, uh, similar to what is we use for photons is luminosity distance. Another thing which I want to say, yes, I have assumed that masses are not spinning. So this is just point masses without any spins. But the neutron star black holes or some other bodies, they could spin. And there, what is important is orientation of the spin with respect to angular, orbital angular momentum. So in general, you can construct total momentum of the system, which is sum of angular momentum, orbital angular momentum, and individual spins. If spins are aligned or anti-aligned with the orbital angular momentum, then uh, the total one will be also pointing along Z direction. If it is not, J could have arbitrary orientation. And what happens there is that uh, we have spin orbital coupling and uh, orbital angular momentum start processing around J. So what happens here, let me try to draw it. If this vector J, this vector L, this orbital plane, and basically we have this precession of L around J. Which means we start to see the system under different angle. And uh, this precession is encoded into gravitational wave. And it's quite important uh, to try to get it, to measure it. It's a smoking gun, whether spins are aligned or anti-aligned or have arbitrary orientation. Why? Because uh, this could tell us information about formation of this binary system. Unfortunately, it's quite hard to see this precession effect because, again, the, uh, we could see the, the, the strongest gravitational wave signal will come from the system which is phase on or off. And if I have precession of this orbit, you don't see it much. If it's age on and you start precessing it, you see it a lot. But these signals are weaker. So unfortunately, the systems from which we could see clearly precession are weaker and therefore a bit harder to, to see. And the systems for which we 
precession is a bit too small because of the projection effect, uh, more frequently to find. Another thing I want to emphasize is this factor two here. So the dominant harmonic from circular orbit, that's important circular orbit, will be at twice orbital frequency. It does not mean that there are no other harmonics, uh, but there are other harmonics, uh, once, three times, four times, five times, etc., of orbital frequency, but they will be significantly weaker. Their amplitude will be suppressed by factor V over C. If you want, I can write you a little bit. So, first and third harmonic will be suppressed by factor V over C and M1 minus M2. So, if uh, masses are comparable, this additional small factor. And then uh, uh, four times omega will be suppressed by factor V over C square, etc. So the dominant harmonic is really twice orbital frequency. If orbit is eccentric, story is different. But uh, let's not touch it right now. For a simple, a simple reason, I, I will mention it again. Gravitational waves, they carry out energy and angular momentum. And uh, carrying out angular momentum basically circularizes very fast the system. So the system uh, which we see that too high accuracy is circular. You need, really need to have very high eccentricity in order to have non-negligible residual eccentricity as it enters just before merger basically. Okay, I'm jumping a bit ahead. Let's move on. Again, I'm too far away. Um, now I want to take into account that uh, energy is removed from the system by gravitational waves. And I can substitute here for the luminosity uh, quadruple momentum of the system. It's third derivative. We have derived this. We have derived I, I, J, K, this quantity. You can construct M out of this by taking the trace out, taking third derivative, and you will get this expression. The total uh, energy in the binary system is very simple. I missed a uh, minus sign here, sorry. It's the potential energy of the system and kinetic energy of the system, and total energy is a minus, uh, it's a half of the potential energy. So you can take the derivative of this, where could it go, into the change in the distance between the bodies and separation. And you equate this to energy removed, I mean, carried out by gravitational waves. This equation could be easily integrated, and you get this expression for A. Or you can transform this into the equation for frequency, orbital frequency. Here is actually gravitational wave frequency, but doesn't matter. The factor two different. Um, using Kepler's law, or you can transform this into uh, equation for delta t time, and integrating it uh, one more time, you get a phase. How orbital phase changes as a function of time. And here I used quantity eta. This is called symmetric mass ratio. It's very convenient sometimes to use it. It's dimensionless. And it varies between zero, well, it never reaches zero, and uh, one quarter. So it has quite nice limits. And now I want to speak a bit more about each of them. So, evolution of the separation in a binary system. This TC is called time to coalescence. So where your time is equal to C, separation is equal to zero. Of course, the whole method, whole approach breaks down well before that, that this time, but that roughly gives us a time required for the merger. That's why it's called time to coalescence. It's quite uh, convenient to express this quantity for the frequency, so how frequency, orbital frequency changes this time. And you can see this negative power there, where time equal time of coalescence, frequency goes to infinity, and this is clearly tells us that 
the whole scheme breaks down. What actually breaks down? First of all, what breaks down is our point mass approximation. This, we say that the size of the bodies much smaller that, uh, than their separation. Of course, when uh, bodies start to touch each other, it's uh, even well before that, it's not true anymore. So we have to stop this procedure before they start really getting into close approach to each other. Then uh, we can introduce this thing, which is called sharp mass. You see it's appearing here, and it's also appearing there. It's a certain combination of M1 and M2, of masses. And uh, since we're working in the leading order, this is the biggest contribution to the phase of gravitational wave. And we are most sensitive to the phase of gravitational wave. We will talk about this in uh, data analysis. So basically, our methods, we are trying to trace, track the phase of gravitational wave. And therefore, the best measured parameter will be this sharp mass. Um, this is how gravitational wave frequency is changing with time. It's also sometimes convenient to estimate, to see it. And especially what I want to emphasize is it's very strong dependence on initial frequency. So this uh, rate of change of frequency in the beginning is extremely slow, and as two bodies approaching, it becomes faster and faster and faster. One more case is when uh, very unequal masses, sometimes we refer to them to extreme mass ratio. There will be system for LISA, which we will talk about, which have a really extreme mass ratio. One body is much larger than another one. In this case, uh, the chirp mass is approximately this one, and you see this M2 over M1 appearing here under this inequality. It's a small parameter. So if you plug it here, then uh, you can see that even at uh, high frequencies, you could have very slow evolution. So for those systems, the small body could spend a lot of cycles in the close vicinity of big body um, before it actually merges. And we will talk about this a bit more when we talk about extreme ratio in spirals. Um, Again, I'm jumping, right? Yes. And again, I'm rewriting the same equations in terms of delta T. Um, time required to coalesce starting with some frequency f. And here are a few estimations. Let's take LIGO Virgo. It operates on the ground and frequency range between 30 hertz and around 200, 2,000 hertz. Actually, the, the, now they improved a little bit. It's uh, around 20 hertz, but it doesn't matter. It's... And you can uh, take a uh, source at 40 hertz for neutron star, neutron star. Again, it's just a order of magnitude estimation. Uh, neutron stars are the, one of the remnants of stellar evolution. Their masses are uh, confined within quite small uh, mass range between uh, roughly 1 and 1.5 solar mass. So 1.4 is a good number. And they come uh, quite uh, similar masses. And you will estimate the time to coalescence will take from 40 hertz until they merge about 20 seconds. If you do the same for the black holes, and uh, let's say you take 30 solar mass black hole each, similar to the very first system which we observed, and you will find that the uh, time to coalesce is less than a second, a third of a second. So, if you fix starting frequency, then more heavy bodies, they merge much faster. They evolve faster. Actually, it's also true for stars. If you take heavy stars, it will evolve much, much faster than a less massive star. And they end up their life in a binary also faster than lighter stars. If you take LISA, LISA will operate in a frequency range between 0.1 and about 100 millihertz. And if you take initial frequency 0.1 millihertz, and we will talk about LISA a bit later, but uh, masses there we're talking about as a million solar masses. It's massive black holes. And if you do the same estimation, you will find that delta T is a 35 days divided by eta. I did not specify what the mass ratio here is. So it's less than a year. It's significantly larger duration of the signal in LISA band as compared to like a Virgo on the ground. But again, I want to emphasize that it's very nonlinear 
function of initial frequencies. So if you improve your sensitivity to low frequencies, you start to see more and more cycles, signal become longer and longer, visible signal. Uh, sometimes I was asked, uh, Earth is moving around Sun. Does it emit gravitational waves? And if yes, why it doesn't fall on the Sun? The answer is yes, it does emit gravitational wave. You try to plug parameters of the solar system in you know, Earth here and try to estimate time which requires for Earth to, to fall on the Sun. And you will find that actually I will, our Sun will burn out, die, and maybe universe change before actually it happens. Now I want to say a few words about post-Newtonian iterations. I mean, I already talked about this, that you're trying to solve in the first order, then you plug solution in back to, into Einstein equations and try to solve it to second order. So, and uh, by doing this scheme, uh, well, for instance, we have derived leading order. I'm plugging back equation of motion into the uh, modified now equation of motion. I now have in spiral. I'm changing frequency and separation into the right-hand side of Einstein equations. I also need to introduce first uh, uh, quadratic terms in H, etc. And I go to next order, this Newtonian order, it's what we have just derived, it's a phase of gravitational wave. Then it will be uh, first post-Newtonian order, it comes with epsilon, epsilon is a V over C. So it's V over C squared, V over C cubed, V over C to the fourth, etc., etc. And now, I mean, because it's important to track phase very accurately, we need to go to higher post-Newtonian orders. I want to uh, also say a few words, just a few words about this term. When I mentioned about, uh, well, before I was talking about background and separating background from gravitational waves, and even more, I was using local inertial frame for the background. If I'm coming close to the source, uh, you cannot do that. It's still, um, the big gravitational wavelengths becomes comparable with the curvature of, created by the binary itself. And there is a very interesting effect coming from that. Uh, basically, you start to have scattering of the gravitational waves on the potential. So you have Newtonian potential created uh, basically monopole part of your binary system, and you have a scattering of uh, gravitational waves back and uh, re-emission at later time, roughly speaking, you know, if this time, this X observer is there, this direct part which is emitted from the binary system here, but there is a somewhat potential here extended over a nearby zone, and what you have, you also have a backscattering of the part of radiation here, and re-emission of this, uh, and it's continuous process, of course, and that's called uh, tail effect. So in this respect, uh, your present state of your binary depends on the uh, infinite past. Of course, uh, contribution to this integral for it's, uh, could be truncated, and only nearby time really contribute to this. But and this is the nature of this 1.5 term, which is appearing here. Right, I want also to give you expression of uh, gravitational wave signal in frequency domain because very often we use frequency domain. And uh, well, plus and cross polarization could be uh, written in symbolic form like cosine and sine of phase. This Fourier transformation. You plug it there and then you're using the uh, fact that amplitude is slowly evolving and it's monotonous function of time. And you can use stationary phase approximation. Basically, this is what is quite often used in quantum mechanics, and you can use it here as well. So basically, you're looking at stationary point, once you subplug it here, and uh, you decompose your uh, phase around the stationary point. And the key point that we, what you will find is this expression for the gravitational wave signal in frequency domain. This is the phase. Again, it has similar expansion in the post-Newtonian orders. That's a leading order. I want to emphasize this part. So, uh, do I have this plot? Probably not. 
if we I plot the amplitude of the gravitational wave as a function of uh, time, then amplitude behaves roughly as a omega to the power two over three, so it's growing. If I plot amplitude, now I use tilde, so it's a function of frequency, as a function of frequency, decreasing in a log log scale, it's minus seven by six, so it's basically, yeah, minus seven by six. Why is that? It's very simple, because uh, again, I will repeat that evolution in the beginning is very slow. So binary spends a lot of time on a single frequency before it moves to the next one. And when you're doing Fourier transform, you need to take into account not only amplitude, but number of cycles spent on that frequency. And in the beginning, there are many, many cycles spent almost uh, single, almost monochromatic, drifting very, very slowly. And at the end, it's drifting very, very fast. So there is hardly a fraction of the cycles before it sweeps to another frequency. And the fact that you have many cycles at a given frequency where binary is very broad, it actually gives you this uh, power law dependence of the amplitude and frequency domain. So in frequency domain, Amplitude of gravitational waves is stronger at low frequencies. In time domain, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is different. Was it clear? Good, uh, let's move on. Movie. So, because I was telling you a lot about uh, binary system, but uh, in gravitational wave, now I want to show how gravitational wave looks like. So this part is a slow in spiral part. Then it comes to the regime where two bodies starts to touch each other. And you can see here, uh, frequency evolution actually doesn't go to infinity. This is where the merger happens. It goes to constant value and uh, yes. So let me try to play it. So you see the beginning is really slow and you will uh, see that you know, at the end it's becoming faster and faster and faster and the last stage is uh, actually milliseconds really. And the speed also increases and the final speed could be as large as 0 0.4, 0 0.5 for the speed of light before it merges. That's it, done. Now, slow motion of the amazing <laughs> last part. <laughs> and uh, basically, the last part, you saw that there was, uh, when the two, blo two black holes merged, it wobbled a bit and then it settled down to the static state. This wobbling is uh, actually what is called uh, uh, ring down radiations, and I will talk about this in a second. Those are gravitational wave signals which were detected uh, so far by LIGO and FIRGO collaborations. And you can see they are different in uh, duration, uh, different in strength, but they, nevertheless they look roughly similar to each other. Actually, is it moving or not? Let's, let's see if it's moving, I don't remember. So this is the first gravitational wave signal. It was the strongest signal so far among all merging black holes. It's very short because the masses of black holes were unexpectedly large. We did not believe that uh, 30 solar mass black holes actually could uh, exist because it's hard to form them uh, in the local universe with high metallicity stars. Um, this is what is called Boxing Day event because it appeared on the Boxing Day. This is one of the lightest binary and you can see duration is significantly longer. And this one is a binary neutron star. I don't know if it's, if it's movie, I can show you how it, Yes, it is. So, to see its duration. This scale in seconds. So we have many, 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 many cycles. But again, we roughly derive this uh, duration for neutron stars and black holes, and this kind of order of magnitude is correct. Boring signal, huh? Yeah. Um, we wait. 
Nothing spectacular happened at the end, believe me. I think it's about 60 or 70. It's almost there, it's almost there. Six seconds, five, four, three. That's all. <laughs> right, uh, so now I want to speak uh, a little bit about modeling of gravitational waves. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly, and that's what we did estimation uh, earlier, and we saw that you know it could be minutes uh, uh, lasting so seconds to minutes in a uh, LIGO band compared to black holes, which is a uh, few seconds and or even milliseconds. Um, gravitational wave signal again, this is the first gravitational wave signal which we observed uh, could be conventionally split into three phases. It's not very strict, you cannot put finger where one stops and another starts, but nevertheless, so the first part is in spiral, and that's what we considered in a zero approximation here for the binary system. It's where a diabetic regime where two bodies, you can treat them as a point masses, they slowly spiral around each other. Uh, and then the merger is where they start to touch each other, or actually slightly before that. One can say that uh, merger starts where in spiral approximation breaks down. That could be mathematical definition of where in spiral is. And the last stage is a ring down. It's where you, the two bodies merged, but it's not yet, a, it's black hole, but it's highly deformed black hole. And it's losing its excitation in the form of very specific radiation called ring down. Actually, Vitor will speak much more about this, I believe. And uh, so this radiation is very specific. It consists of uh, uh, harmonics, dump, uh, basically dumping sinusoids. Uh, but the frequency and the dumping time of each of these modes is intrinsic to the black hole, to its mass and spin. So basically, if you detect several of them, you can say whether the object is consistent with black hole or not. It's a very important part. Now, Post-Newtonian theory is uh, where we're trying to solve Einstein equation approximately and uh, in iterations, assuming slow velocity v over c and v expanding and solving uh, order by order. And it is valid for, uh, as we said, for high separations. Where separation becomes uh, small, nothing works. And uh, there is no analytic solution, even approximately. You need to uh, solve Einstein equation honestly, using numerical methods. So you plug in your Einstein equations into the computer in a smart for formulation so that your programs come and understand how to solve it, and you're solving it. Um, unfortunately, it is very expensive. So to, to compute waveform for one merging black hole, let's say 20 cycles, uh, before merger, merger and ring down takes a few weeks to few months, depending on the mass ratio and the spin values. So it's really a state of art. You cannot do it in the mass production. Actually, they're doing it in mass production, but you need some guidance in which part of the parameter space you would want to compute this uh, waveform. And there is another um, region, large mass ratio, I already have mentioned, which allows you another uh, way of solving uh, binary, uh, well, Einstein equation for binary systems perturbatively, and there's different perturbation. You're considering big black hole as, a, for instance, scare black hole, and you're considering your background as a background of uh, gravitational space-time of the uh, care black hole, and then you're considering small body here as a perturber. So you don't use uh, slow velocity anymore. Your small parameter here is mass ratio. So your small body creates small perturbation in the uh, rather smooth and nice care background or Schwarzschild background, whatever you prefer, whatever you assume about central black hole. And you can, uh, again, solve this in perturbation. It's uh, non-trivial because your background is uh, highly curved, but nevertheless, you can uh, try to do that. Uh, you're talking... Well, there is no actually limit for numerical relativity. The limit is actually computational time. Because uh, you need to resolve 
the larger mass ratio, the slower your evolution. That's what I have shown. So to make one orbit, you need uh, many, many numerical step sizes. And therefore, basically, computers choke on it. They cannot, they, it takes years to produce few orbits. Or you need to change current numerical schemes to solve Einstein equations. People also working on that. Six M, roughly six M. So I'm t measuring uh, distance in uh, units of mass. So it's a six Schwarzschild radius, or you know, of the characteristic mass. Or you take total mass. So six M is roughly where uh, people think it breaks down. But actually, post-Newtonian theory works amazingly well in a regime where it's supposed not to work. But you need to do a few tricks, and I will talk about this now. This is uh, what I mentioned uh, earlier as effective one-body approach. And what is done there? So it's the extension of the Keplerian orbit into relativistic regime. You transform the two-body problem, two-body of comparable masses into a central body with mass m1 plus m2. If you have spins, there is also transformation for the spins. And another body here, you attach mass to it, uh, symmetric mass ratio, exactly like in the Keplerian problem. But then, space-time of the central object, you treat not as the Schwarzschild or Kerr, but perturbed Schwarzschild or Kerr. And the perturbation is proportional to the mass ratio. So you derive uh, effective space-time, which is perturbed Schwarzschild or perturbed Kerr, and you're moving this small mass in, uh, in this effective space-time. In addition, you can, what you can do, and this allows actually to go quite well, quite, to quite, quite small separations because of this treatment of the problem. In addition, what you can do, post-Newtonian series, this when you expand and solve by iterations V over C, is poorly convergent. And you can do smart uh, resummation of this series to improve the convergence. So using this first and second, and there is a third thing which you need to want to use, um, Post-Newtonian calculations becomes really tedious when you're going to higher orders. A lot of problems and uh, very hard. Nevertheless, you can predict the form of the terms which should appear there, functional form. You just don't know numerical coefficients. So you can plug them into your waveform and uh, feed numerical coefficients using numerical data. So you're taking numerical waveforms, you compare, you start to understand what this uh, coefficient should be. You don't know this, but you uh, fit it from the exact, well, let's call it exact numerical solution. And this allows us to propagate in spiral to the merger as well. And at some point, usually it's around light ring. Light ring usually it is where it's the last stable orbit of the massless particle around the black hole. You start attaching ring down. Again, from rig down, you know, um, you know the frequency and damping time of each mode. What you don't know is the amplitude, and you're trying to smoothly attach one to another. And that's how you can build a semi-analytic uh, way, um, the full waveform. And this is, uh, roughly speaking, that's what effective one-body approach is doing. The problem is this, it's a fully generated in time domain. It's a bit slow because in spiral part is uh, you need to, they're using um, Hamiltonian approach, so you need to solve ordinary differential equations. It's a bit slow. Another approach you can take is uh, phenomenological. There are people constructing waveform completely in frequency domain because for data analysis, we need the waveforms in frequency domain. I will show it later. And what you can do, you take this in spiral. You remember stationary phase approximation. You're saying in this region, my stationary phase approximation should work very well. And you put slightly a somewhat finger. It's a region. It's not exactly a line. It's a region uh, where this validity you think is breaking down. And there you don't know anything. However, you have numerical waveforms obtained from numerical relativity solving two-body problem on the computers. You introduce three parameters and making fit. Well, it sounds extremely easy and a logical thing to do. Of course, the fitting this and uh, uh, 
the range of fit depends on availability and accuracy of the numerical waveforms. Therefore, for this to work very well, you want to extend a number of numerical relativity waveforms um, to higher mass ratio, to higher spins, and probably cover parameter space quite accurately so that you know, your fit parameters uh, and interpolation in the between points is, becomes accurate. There are a lot of advantages of these uh, phenomenological waveforms. It's uh, analytic and very fast to generate, and this is quite important for data analysis. Okay? Again, I'm too far away. Now I'm coming to, what time do I stop? 15, okay, good. And now I'm coming to detection of gravitational waves, basic principle. So for modeling, we look at the binary system, we saw how it evolves in the leading order, and by doing iterative process procedure, you can go to higher post orders and corrections to uh, phase of gravitational wave and to amplitude of gravitational wave. Uh, also, I just described hand wave how you can construct semi-analytic uh, waveform for detecting gravitational waves, including in spiral, merger, and ring down. There are two approaches, <coughs> and they're both used. And now I'm coming to the detection. Detection, I mean, uh, I want to recall again the geodesic deviation equation, and where we consider this geodesic deviation equation in case of the gravitational wave. We looked at some point at the ring of particles. In the beginning, we used a two observer, but then we ex extended to the ring of particles, and we saw how the ring of particles changes under a gravitational wave. This plus polarization, this cross polarization. And the basic idea I already mentioned is we place one mirror here, two mirrors there, and we send lasers back and forth between these mirrors to get the uh, uh, distances between central mirror and end mirrors. And we're using Michelson interferometer, actually it's a bit more than just Michelson interferometer, in order to measure these differences in uh, distances. So basically, in the beginning, do I have a picture here? Okay, that's a better picture. This is LIGO. Uh, this beam splitter, so laser goes here, then it splits into two directions, along Y axis and along X, it's bouncing off the end mirror, so it turns back. And we have interferometer, inter, interfer, interference here. And the interferometer initially set up in such a way that there is a dark fringe, so it's a destructive interference here. If masses start to move under influence of gravitational wave, uh, interference picture starts to change. That's a theoretical picture. The practical, it does never change. Actually, your mirrors are pushed back so that it's always dark fringe and you just take readouts how much you need to push mirrors, but uh, it doesn't matter. I will skip for time being these mirrors, this and that. Let's assume that there is only one here and one there. This sensitivity of detectors, it's uh, to LIGOS, but Virgo is there in Italy, actually not far from here, I guess, not that far, not that far. It's, uh, and I want to look at the, how do we take gravitational waves, interaction of the basically electromagnetic, I mean the whole system is gravitational waves in a bit more details. In case of LIGO uh, and Virgo, what happens is uh, gravitational wavelength is significantly larger than size of the device. And because of that, because of that, uh, so G alpha beta is equal to eta alpha beta, plus x squared divided by r squared, and uh, x squared is proportional to omega, no, over r squared, is proportional to omega uh, x, x is basically L squared times h gravitational wave squared. The key point is this, term omega L, it's much less than one. And what I want to say is not to write this formula, what I want to say is that uh, local inertial frame which we assumed here, which is uh, with respect to the background, because of this small factor here, we can extend this local inertial frame to the size of whole detector. So we can cover by local inertial frame cool detector. So basically you can treat our metric as a Minkowski 
on the whole size of, on the size of the whole detector. It's not always true, for instance, for LISA we cannot do that, but for LIGO we can because this is true. Gravitational wave frequency times uh, L, size of the detector is much less than one. It means that the gravitational wave length is much larger than size of your detector. And this simplifies tremendously picture. It means that we can place coordinate frame here such that it's basically a space time is flat here. Flat, but uh, <clears throat> nothing, uh, we cannot remove second derivative of uh, metric. We just can make metric in this form, but we cannot eliminate second derivative of the metric. We cannot eliminate curvature. And curvature appears in our geodesic equations. And basically geodesic equations are taking very simple form in here because our coordinates x and y becomes at the same time proper distances. So this is very simple frame and very simple approaches uh, and uh, it's very easy to, for engineers to understand what they're doing. For them it's basically what they see when they see this equation, say, oh, there is a gravitational field looks like a tidal field, which is a function of time, and it moves my mirrors. I can measure the distance, basically. That's what it's written here. And similar for cross-polarization. Very easy approach. So then you're looking at the face of your laser, this frequency of the laser, uh, this one moving in x direction, and you take the difference between round trip along uh, y and back, x and back, and you will find that uh, phase difference is equal to this quantity. Quite often, uh, well actually always, and it's important part, the arm lengths, x and y, so the both of arm, uh, arms of the detector taken to be the same. And therefore, uh, this general formula, but these are equal, so they go away, and what you have, phase difference is proportional to the arm length and gravitational wave amplitude. And that's the reason why we need to build very large detectors. If you fix H, H does not depend much on us, if there is a gravitational wave source somewhere out there, let's say binary black hole or something else. And if you want to improve sensitivity of your detector, so increase delta phi, which you can measure, that's what you want, you want large delta phi, so it's easy to measure, you need to increase your arm length. And that's why you have four kilometer arm length in case of LIGO and three kilometers in case of Virgo. Yes, so basically in this frame, what you see is that uh, your laser propagates like in flat space time. This is basically a flat space time formula for propagation of the laser light. And what you see is that distance between beam splitter and two end mirrors changes, okay? It's a very easy picture. Um, in the case of LISA and PTA, you cannot make such assumption. Their gravitational frequency becomes, well, gravitational wavelengths becomes comparable to the size of your device, of size of LISA or size of the distance between Earth and the pulsar. And there you cannot cover, cool your system by local inertial frame. And you need to solve, you need to bring back H menu. And this is the case we're quite often using, actually always using transverse traceless gauged coordinates. And we need to solve everything rigorously. So the metric is basically for gravitational wave in that direction is written in this form. You don't need to write, just, just listen. I want to you understand you know, the, the physics of this and the dependence on the coordinate frame in some respect. And what is important in this frame, you see the metric depends only on Z. So if your uh, arm lengths were along X and Y, actually they will not move in this frame. Transfer traceless TT frame is such that they co moving in coordinates are co moving together with the gravitational wave. So it is coordinate distance which does not change. If your arms or end mirrors were at the rest in the beginning, they will be always in rest. But not the proper distance. The proper distance, which is written here, does change. So it, it contains GXX, which is not one. So your proper distance does change, but coordinate, system, coordinate distance between two bodies does not change. 
What does it mean? It means that you need to solve properly the equation of propagation for your laser light. And that's a basically an equation which tells us that your laser, your photon, is a massless particle. It's, a, it's a moving along null direction. You can integrate it because the so form of the metric is quite simple. Again, take a difference between round trip along x and y, and you will find this more general expression. This expression does not assume that omega gravitational waves times L much less than one, or that gravitational wavelengths much larger than size of your device. This is a more general thing. Again, you can put uh, arm lengths equal to, to each other, and then this term disappears. But you will have here more complex structure, and this h is integral of your gravitational wave strain. strain. Of course, you can, uh, for LIGO, again, make this assumption that uh, this quantity is much less than one, make a Taylor decomposition, and you will return to a well-known result. I just want to say this is more general. So, you see, I have changed the coordinate frame, and my interpretation becomes completely different. So if before, in beam splitter, I, I, for LIGO Virgo, I can cover my whole detector by a local inertial frame, and there what I see is that uh, laser propagates like in flat space time, and it, the only effect is just end mirrors moving under the influence of gravitational wave. Here it's different. In my coordinate frame, Mirrors do not move at all, but the laser light is affected by gravitational waves. So its phase, or equivalently you can say about frequency, is affected by gravitational wave. And so it's a really point of view. Your measurements does not change. Your end result will be the same, but the interpretation could be quite different depending on in which frame you are sitting. And that's important to understand the coordinate effects from the actual observations, observables. Is it clear? Okay, you are tired, eh? Let's move on. Um, now I want to speak a bit about LIGO Virgo, and here I again uh, use long wavelength approximation. It's much easier for me. And what detector sees, it's actually not H plus H cross. What it sees is this what called strain H of T, differential change in arm length. And here HIJ could be arbitrary, propagating in arbitrary direction. And what we see is basically projections of HIJ on the arm lengths of the, your detector. So N1 and N2, it's uh, your detector is here, there, and this will be N, let's say, 2, this will be N1 vector. So you project your H on the arm lengths and you take a difference. That's what the detector sees. Um, you can always decompose uh, your HIJ into two polarization state plus and cross. We already done it. Plug it back, and you will have this expression. H plus H cross is what we have derived today. You can look, you know. And F plus F cross is what is called antenna beam function. It's a function of sky position of the source, theta and phi, in polar angles. And it's a function of polarization angle. We talked a little bit about polarization, and uh, I was telling you that uh, you, can, uh, you have freedom in choosing your polarization. And what happened, polarization chosen for the source frame, where they're attached to the source, and the uh, polarization attached to the detector frame did not match, and they're related to the rotation angle. And this rotation angle appears here as polarization one. So that's where sky dependence enters in this F plus F cross. Now, how does it look like? Um, yeah, I think I just skipped a bit. Let's go back for a second, really a second. Um, now I can substitute here H plus H cross as uh, some amplitude plus times cosine of the phase of gravitational waves, and for H cross I can substitute amplitude cross times sine of phase. And then I can recombine this whole thing here into this formula, okay? I have to redefine this phase. It will contain polarization angle and uh, sky location, but nevertheless it's just some constant phase. And there is some amplitude, which is here, and luminosity distance. 
I put here capital I here and there because it will be different for each detector. But so far we're considering only one detector, okay? For one detector, that's what we see. That's all. Now F plus F cross, if you look at the angular dependence, they look like this, it's quadrupolar pattern. And if you look at unpolarized, so basically, uh, roughly speaking, F plus, uh, this amplitude F plus F cross, uh, averaging over inclination angle, it will look like this. And this 45 degrees, your arms basically, one is here, another is there, and this 45 degrees between two arms. That's where you have zero. That's your angular dependence of your detector, and the best sensitivity is above and underneath of the detector plane. Okay? Now I want to bring your attention to this thing. So what we actually can measure is this amplitude, this single detector. We can redefine it as an effective distance, and that's the only thing we can say. With one detector, you cannot tell anything about sky location. You cannot say anything about inclination because everything is here. It's completely degenerate. It is true if, uh, that, uh, if your signal is uh, very strong, uh, very short, because Earth actually moves around Sun, Earth rotates, so if duration of your signal much shorter than characteristic uh, time of changing of position of your detector, that is true. If your signal is a really long lift of other day or, you know, so it's not a, uh, probably, I don't know, not for LIGO or Virgo, but um, if it happens, then you, need to, then you start <coughs> breaking this degeneracy by Doppler modulation. So your signal will be Doppler modulated because of the motion of your detector. But for short signals, which are black holes and uh, neutron stars, it is true. So what you can do, if you have two detectors, you have a circle in the sky. Basically, it's triangulations by time difference, travel time you know, between uh, detectors. It's the same system what is used in GPS. You need uh, several GPS uh, satellites in order to triangulate you and to find where your location is. The same here. If you have only two detectors, by the time difference, you know roughly your source is somewhere here. If you have three detectors, you have two points, either here or there. It's not entirely true, because even uh, where Virgo was offline and there were only two LIGO detectors, you could say something about sky location. And this is because, again, I'm too far. Phase and amplitude here are function of your instrument. So you have to have consistent signal in amplitude and in phase as well, as a simply time travel between two sides. So this adding a little bit more information and you start to break the genesis so you don't have a circle, but you start to have more patches on, uh, along this circle. But you need the three or more the really detectors in order to start seeing where the source is on the sky. And that's actually for binary neutron stars. It was really lucky that uh, Virgo was online and uh, have decent sensitivity at that point because they had, they had a lot of hardware problems. And, and this allowed actually to quite well localized source on the sky. So, detectors. I already mentioned a few times, a few this LIGO detectors. Virgo actually now is operational, or was operational. Now all of them under upgrade. There is GEO 600, but it's not hardly used because it's only 600 meters arm length, so it's not very sensitive. There is a detector is being built, well, will be built in LIGO, India. It's this, uh, in Hanford used to be two detectors two in one. Now one was completely decommissioned and the components will be moved to India and uh, rebuilt as a third detector, is another detector. And there is very interesting project in Kagra in Japan. They uh, tried to do some very novel technology. It's still under construction, but uh, they're trying to beat uh, seismic noise at low frequencies. For that, you need to go underground. So they're going underground in order to avoid the waves propagating on the surface of the Earth. And they also decided to do cryogenic uh, uh, cooling mirrors to reduce thermal noise. Very interesting technology, and probably that's where Virgo and LIGO will go 
as a plus plus upgrade. And a few things about sensitivity. So as I mentioned, the, the biggest problem at low frequencies is the seismic noise. Uh, Earth is unstable. It's not only Earth. It's also human factor. It's uh, um, clouds, um, trains, cars, whatever is around us. It's everything what is low frequency part. Low frequency in the meaning of water hertz or above. And it's quite steeply rising. So one of the solutions to beat it is to go underground. That's what Kagra is doing. Uh, mid frequencies, the limiting noise is the thermal noise of the mirrors. And that's why also Kagra is trying to beat this noise by doing uh, cooling the mirrors. And the high frequency noise is a quantum noise. It's because of the number of photons in the laser that fluctuates because of Heisenberg uncertainty. And this creates uh, basically the, the noise. One way of to improve this uh, uh, short noise is to go to higher power. So you increase number of photons in your um, uh, in your cavity. Now I'm coming to the cavity. <laughs> and so that you can reduce the quantum noise. Another technology which will be used to reduce quantum noise is uh, uh, to have a squeezed laser light. So it's not the... Uh, I'm not going into details. Well, now I will briefly say before I stop about the mirrors which you can see here and there. So what we talked about is uh, this beam splitter and end mirrors here and there and light bouncing here. Instead, you can plug mirror here and there. So first of all, you effectively increase your arm length. It's a Fabri Piero cavity, so there is a laser light bouncing several times here before it goes to bumps, beam splitter. Second of all, you also increase the power circulating inside each arm. This mirror is another, it's called power recycling mirror. You don't want to waste a lot of uh, laser light coming back. So you want to bounce it back into the system, and again, because of that, you increase power of light from 20 volt laser here, to 100 kilowatt circulating inside your arms. And this signal recycling mirror, uh, it's a very nice idea. You can improve your sensitivity at a given frequency by building a resonator. So for instance, if you know that there is a source, monochromatic or almost monochromatic source in this region, you can improve sensitivity by almost order of magnitude here, but on expense that you get much worse elsewhere. So you really need to have guaranteed sources in order to say, well, have good motivation to, to use this technique and to make uh, uh, work detected in a resonator state. I think I will stop here. Yes, I, will, I have to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.